Nihanyang! Hello, I am the Dark Fae and welcome back to Confessions of a First Time Dungeon Master. We had a little bit of a break. We did have a couple weeks where some players couldn't make it and we had a couple of one shots in between, but now we are back. So, uh, since it's been a while since the last um, Confessions, make sure to go back and watch um, the previous session, which I will put up in the corner for you over here to catch up on what uh, happened last time. We are now in session 38, so let's begin. Okay, so now um, with them in the library, they have solved a puzzle um, and now they're kind of going back to revisit the other two puzzles that they had looked at but not really totally investigated. So they first start off with the kind of the puzzle with the missing books on the bookshelf. It's a miss, uh, session of the bookshelf with that is empty, um, and there are five little orbs identical to one of the orbs that they saw in the foyer, like the one above the door that kind of was initially colorless and then started glowing purple once they defeated the fear effigy. Um, there are five of those kind of lined up on the on the shelf, and then in the back kind of on the bookshelf's wall, there is inscribed, find your fears from top to bottom and left to right. So um, then they all kind of started spreading out the library, kind of investigating, searching for specific books. Um, originally, I had kind of done, I had kind of laid like false books, sort of, but the initial investigation checks were enough so that they kind of found what they were looking for. And then they have um, books that are colored in correspondence with the different colors of fear, sorry, the different colors of effigies, so purple for fear, um, blue for death, black for unknown, red for monsters, nope, red for pain, yellow for monsters. Um, and that the correct book is one that has a matching orb on the spine, has no other title or marking otherwise. For the solution of this puzzle, my original thought had been that they would have to place the books in the order as they saw in the foyer, um, basically from top to bottom and left to right. It would go fear, pain, unknown, monsters, death. But um, I had kind of not really planned out the, the actual like clue to give them, and so it kind of ended up making it sound like you had to place them in the order in which you found them, sort of, or in the correct orientation where the books were found in the library, and I decided I liked that better. It's a bit of a simpler one, but um, I think it still works. So they um, find all of the books, they make sure to mark the colors kind of on the Rule 20 map, like where the books are found, and they put the books in the correct order, and they receive the letters... Um, R, E, and O. So that is that puzzle finished. Now, the book puzzle that is in the center of the room is one that they've been having a little bit of trouble with. And I suppose the answer was not as apparent as maybe I thought, but let me know what you guys think. Let me describe the puzzle for you. So there's a book on a pedestal um, in the center of the room. And there is a pen, or there's a quill and ink pot sitting next to it. Beneath the book, there is a a wooden chest that is locked that has the words, The book holds the key. So this book, once opened, turns to a page that has um, this following kind of inscription. Once upon a time, Blink was walking through the woods when... They came upon a blank tree. They reached up um, and plucked one of the delicious looking fruits and continued on their way. Something like that. Paraphrasing a little. Um, and then there's also kind of an illustration of a little person kind of walking along and a coming upon an illustration of a tree. So let me know down in the comments down below what you think the proper approach or solution to this presented puzzle is. So, 
um, a little bit stumped. They decide to, that they want to go and snoop around in the libraries, in the librarian's study, which is locked, and they have seen that there is a key hanging around her neck right behind kind of the ruby necklace. Um, so then they decide to, in order to find clues about this puzzle, and in order to kind of stop worrying about sneaking around in the library, to confront the librarian. So uh, they do that in the center of the room. Uh, Emmerich kind of makes a big noise to attract the librarian. Combat ensues. Um, this librarian is tough. Uh, she's got the help of like certain books that hold souls. And she can kind of use that energy, similar to the spell um, Soul Jar, Soul Cage, maybe Cage, um, Soul Cage, in that she can kind of use it to uh, either siphon energy and heal herself, or she can use it to kind of grant advantage on the next attack, um, stuff like that. So, um, couple. It mostly focuses on, I believe. Umrik and Tehral, who are kind of in on the front lines more so. Um, one of them almost goes unconscious. They get to like seven health. It's kind of close, but they are eventually able to wear the librarian down and defeat her. So as she, once she kind of is defeated, um, her form, which originally has like those long, four spindly kind of spidery arms, they kind of like retract into her body and she actually, her form kind of seems to morph a little bit and she kind of just becomes a normal human looking woman who is now dead on the library floor. Um, Merc now casts Animate Dead on her. So she is now a zombie following them around. And um, then they go into the librarian's study. So... The librarian study, um, mostly kind of shelves in the back, a large desk in the middle of the room, and as well as kind of a large ritual-looking circle um, kind of etched into the ground. There are a lot of those, I'm realizing, in my in my campaign and one-shot, so that for some reason there's always just magic circles everywhere. But on her desk are like a, com a knick-knack, are a combination of things, with knick-knacks, books, uh, parchment and quills and inks um, that are all very like neatly piled up. There are also two jars that when the uh, the players approach um, seem to f be holding this sort of a mist and the mist actually coalesces into faces and they kind of lead with the players to free them and help them. These are trap souls that have been trapped in jars that have not yet been transferred kind of to books and they glean that the librarian um, has been siphoning souls and trapping them inside books. I think they also find like um, the ritual book kind of that she used in order to do this. Um, they also kind of search around her desk and they find a series of kind of journal entries and what look like unsent letters that kind of speak to who the librarian is. So um, I don't think they gleaned her name, but they do le have learned her name by now. Her name is Analda. And she, and so it basically kind of tells them how she came to the tower. It kind of reveals that she um, had been sick for a very long time. She kind of had like some sort of terminal illness. And she went with the Oni, Masters and Kane, um, in the hopes that he would be able to cure her or stop her affliction, which he did in the form of the necklace that she wears, which is a periapt of health, um, which makes you immune to disease and I believe stops any, um, stops like the progression of any disease that is currently in your system. Um, so, however, in payment, sort of, the Oni started to kind of have her, sort of started to kind of corrupt her and have her start doing, um, learning dark magic and kind of learning to siphon souls out of people and trap them, which is an evil act. And um, like, these are things that she 
kind of resisted at first, but once she was like forced into doing it, it kind of started to change her personality and she started to undergo this transformation into um, the librarian, into this kind of monstrosity kind of a creature. Um, she, the letters are kind of addressed to someone, I believe, put the name somewhere, but I think it's Damas, and basically telling him to like, um, first starting off hopeful that she can return soon and will be healthy again and there'll be a family, um, before kind of changing to a tone of fear where she's uncertain about the things that she has to do and like she doesn't want to do them and she's afraid that they'll change her into eventually kind of twisting into a apology where she can't come home anymore and asks him to take care of their daughter Rella and then basically it descends into just this these scrawlings of a mad woman um like the pen tearing through the paper as she kind of loses her ability to write and such even which is shame kind of because she really loved stories and books and writing and that's why she was kind of the librarian of the tower um so and so um they also look for clues as to this this book puzzle about trees or or books or quills or anything in the in the study but um there's nothing there because so this is like kind of a a DM thing, or maybe just me playing a lot of games or sort of investigating kind of puzzles where, in my mind, um, each of these puzzles has been kind of very self-contained and very kind of individual. Like, they've all had their own separate things, and they haven't really related to any outside factors with maybe the exception of uh, the effigies that the book's kind of related to. Um, but So it just seemed really odd to me that with the, it would not be assumed for like a puzzle that is meant to be kind of solved, that um, not all of the information would kind of be presented to you there. So it just it just was an odd thing to be like, well, for me to be like, well, why would there be anything like elsewhere relating to the puzzle when it's all right there for you? But um, so eventually, after finishing up with the study and killing the librarian, they go back to the book and takes a little bit of time, a little bit of pushing. I tell them that. You know, after being in the librarian study and noticing that she has all of these different quills and ink pots, you do notice that this ink, the ink um, in the ink pot next to the book is the same color as the ink in the book. And then it took a couple more minutes where they're still like, it couldn't be that we have to write in the book, right? And I was just like, you gotta write in the book. It's a library. Books. You write stories. Is it that hard of a of a stretch, but, um, so eventually Tyrell is the one who kind of picks up the pen because the little image has had his likeness, um, so he writes his name, Tyrell, and then he, for the blank, and then he writes apple for the tree, so it then reads, like, once upon a time, Tyrell was walking through the woods when he happened upon an apple tree. He reached up and plucked one of the delicious looking fruits and went on his way. So the little illustration now animates and little apples are drawn in ink on the tree and the little figure kind of walks up to it, reaches up, plucks an apple, and in that, in which case, Tyrell feels an apple or something fall into his pocket. When he goes to check, it is an apple. So there are things in the book that affect the real world now. So um, with the first kind of introductory warm-up page to kind of show them what, um, how it kind of works. The book kind of flips itself to a different page and gives them this prompt. Once upon a time, Link set out on a quest. They must traverse through an enchanted forest to reach the treasures at the end. As they walk, the sun is shining, birds occasionally flit through the trees, and flowers are blooming along the path they tread. 
that there's a little kind of rudimentary illustration of a forest. Um, and so Terrell writes the favorable five, which is the name of the group. So all five of them boop, 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 appear inside of the book and they start to walk along this um, walk along this path in this forest and little ink birds kind of swoop in and out of the frame um, and like little flowers start to bloom as they walk. So the page flips again. They come upon a fork in the road, one that leads left and one that leads right. Blank. Um, the favorable five decide to travel. Blank. Um, they do ask some questions like, can we see anything along each either path? And I was like, no, it's it's an ink drawing of literally just a fork in the road. So I believe they choose to go right because according to Basil, you always go right. Um, and so then the page flips and it now reads, as the trees get denser, narrowing their path, they come to a tall fallen tree trunk that blocks their way. Our heroes blink to get past it. After some discussion, they decide to write, help each other. And so um, the little ink drawings of them kind of are shown, giving each other boosts and legs up and kind of pulling each other up over the tree trunk in order to get safely past it and continue on. Um, the page flips again. So as they continue on, the forest begins to get darker, mist rolling along the forest floor. There is the sound of flapping wings as blank swoop overhead. The tree branches become more numerous, long reaching boughs hanging low, dense enough that they scrape against blank's face and hands. And so with this one, with much discussion, again, a lot of discussion for each of these, um, they decide to go with bats, as that is them seemingly thematic, and Tyrell chooses Ivar's name since he is kind of made of metal, so the scratching and stuff won't affect him too much. So the the characters in the book, little ink drawings continue on with mist rolling in, little bats kind of flit in and out of the trees. Um, the tree branch is kind of drawn low and like kind of reaching and scratching against Ivar's face. And in real life, or <laughs> in real life, in the real world for them, um, little like dings and scratches kind of start to appear in Avar's face. Not enough to do damage, but definitely having an effect on him. So there is, there is another turning of the page, and now it says, A low wailing can be heard from behind the heroes. As they turn to look, a ghostly figure appears behind them, rising from the ground. It starts to drift towards them, eyes aglow. And so at this point, um, behind Teyrol, a ghostly figure of a woman, semi-transparent, rises up out of the ground, her eyes glowing this kind of an icy blue glow. And she enters Teyrol's body. He's got to make it. I believe it's a charisma saving throw. Does not make it. And he is now possessed by a ghost. So there are some interesting things that go along with this since it is kind of a figment of the book as well. But that is where we ended the session. Tyrell is possessed. They're writing a story in a book that's kind of real, kind of not. The librarian said, and she's a zombie. Um, and still got quite a few more rooms to get through. We'll see if that can be done um, without much hitch, but you know me, going to throw some kinks in there. So um, yeah, that is what happened in this session. Pretty, pretty exciting. I was a little bit surprised to see them spend so long in the library, but I'm also kind of glad they did because the library is, the library and the foyer are the two rooms probably that I have spent the most time prepping and have thought out the most. So. Um, yeah, I'm pretty pleased. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for notifications when I put out new videos. I love you all, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!